We used to have a text chain and like a Facebook thing. And we'd go to Christopher's all the time. That was the spot. And talk beer and like say, hey, you got extra this hop or you need a bag of this grain, whatever. And that is totally gone by the wayside. I think that's just a little microcosm of where the industry is as far as competitiveness. I, not that I feel like any ill will or competitive nature toward either these guys or sure, any other yeah. brewery. It's just the nature of a more ro um, mature industry. I sure. think we're hitting that kind of mature point in the beer industry like any industry does. Yeah, for those of you who have been here before, you guys know that Atwood's Tavern is always a really special place. We always do live music here. What we've been doing recently is we've been doing an interview series where we're talking to various different people, politicians, journalists, culture makers, brewers today. Uh, and so today, we are very excited to have what we're calling our first sort of brewer's roundtable. I kind of like to think it's a little bit like a brewer's summit as well. But joining me today is right over there is Alex Robbie. He is the principal, the founder, and the head. <laughs> I learned the word principal was like a nice way of saying founder the other day. But Alex Robbie is the founder of Portico Brewing. Matt Steinberg right over here next to me is the founder of Exhibit A. And Chris Koch is the founder and head brewer. I should also mention that you guys, the two of you are also both the head brewers of um, Idle Hands Craft Ales, which is out in Malden. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, you know, so there's a lot. I think everyone who's here, everyone who's been in a tavern, everyone who's above the age of 25 knows what craft beer is, and they've probably had a lot of craft beers themselves. But... <laughs> but, you know, I think one thing real quick, a lot of us probably don't know, and if you do, you're a little bit better than I do, but Matt, why don't you quickly do an overview of exactly how a beer gets made? How do we start from water? And I know it's a very complex process, but... I'm going to simplify it. Exactly. What are the simple steps that you think the average consumer should just know right off the bat about how a beer so, gets made? <laughs> wow. We're going back to seventh grade science. Can you guys hear me all right? Um, so water and uh, cereal grains, be it barley, wheat, rye, corn, sometimes sunflower seeds, triticale, buckwheat. What else are we using? Rice, corn, uh, rye, thank you, um, are combined with the water to make some sugars. Uh, those sugars are then boiled in the form of water. So we've got wort. That wort is, uh, is very sweet. So we have some bittering, obviously the hops. Uh, once that boiling is done, we cool it down, we move it over to a fermenter where we add yeast. The yeast poops out both alcohol and carbon dioxide and creates alcohol. Then we uh, move it to a pa package and you drink it. Uh, um, we make correct. beer. Very simple. Well, so one thing that you hear a lot when people talk about beer is the prevalence of hops, Simcoe, Amarillo. I mean, I think every time I go and order an IPA, they always make a point to highlight the hops. Why is the hop in particular something that is noteworthy? And that's a question that's open to all of you. Uh, well, I mean, the hops are really important for the bitterness. That's what people think of when they think of hops, is that you have this really sweet liquid, and then how, do you, how does it get palatable to actually drink? And that's where the hops come in. So you can actually make beer without hops, but for the most part, they're in there to balance all that sweetness. Um, here in New England, though, I mean, hops have taken on a completely different um, thing where we use them for more aromatics. So the New England IPA especially is uh, known for more of a fruity sort of aroma. And so the hops that we use are much different in their, uh, I don't want to get into alpha acids, but they're just differently made. You, you use hops that are much more aromatic and fruity smelling. So um, around these parts, I would say that hops are um, like your four seam or any of the four seam's got a lot of fruity hops in there, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a New England style, I think, right? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a New England style. I mean, you know, to add on to what Alex is saying is, it's basically the hops being used today are not being used as the way they were traditionally. So we have a lot of these hops like Simcoe and Amarillo and Galaxy and Citra. They've all been bred to give you flavors of fruit, citrus, tropical fruit, um, kind of non-traditional beer flavors. Um, and what some of the uh, the forerunners of the New England beer or New England IPA style um, 
took these hops and abused them in, in unique ways to create flavors in beer that you wouldn't normally expect. So when you have a beer like Four Seam or Six Seam, you're tasting a lot of tropical fruits, you're tasting a lot of citrus flavors, and it's not because I'm adding that juice to that beer and creating and, and um, adding that flavor that way. It's all done through these new age hops um, that contribute these type of characteristics to the beer. Um, you know, and is hop the predominant place where the flavor comes from? I mean, you see things like Ballast Point has what they're calling the mango IPA, or you see pineapple IPAs coming around. But in most beers, is hop where a majority of that flavor is coming from? Uh, just to be clear, like the, the Ballast Point beers that you're mentioning, yeah. those actually use... Uh, I don't. This isn't meant to be a downside, but they're using an extract to create those pineapple flavors, habanero flavors, whatever flavors. They're not actually getting those flavors from the hops. Um, to sort of echo Chris's point about the hops being bred to create these flavors, we can get. You know, the look of the beer is a thing too now. Obviously, like I'm looking. I'm, I'm guessing those are either wandering thoughts or foreseen. I don't know what those are, but neither. But they look like that, right? They're cloudy. They're, they're, they have a, a turbidity to them, meaning they're opaque. Uh, we, the hops that we're trying to use to emulate these pineapple flavors are able to uh, you know, emulate the fruit that we could technically use. I could throw some orange extract in there, or I can use citra. Wait, are you telling me that you, they're not actually throwing just orange peels inside of, inside of the entire mixture to get that feeling? That's a derived flavor from something else? Uh, I suppose it depends on the brewery. We don't, yeah. we use, if we're using fruit, we're using actual fruit. Yeah. If we're using uh, other flavors, we're using those products. Uh, I just choose not to use extract. There's a lot of breweries that do use them. I don't have an issue with them as a consumer. I have an issue with them as a producer. Yeah. Um, Can you, well, what is that issue as a producer? Authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. Caring a lot about what the ingredients are. You can see my hat. No farms, no f no beer. Well, same thing. You know, we we care so much about the farmers' input into what we do that if we were to use a laboratory-derived product, it kind of defeats the whole point. Yeah. Do you guys take a similar approach to that? Portico. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, we do. I yeah. mean, for the most part, the integrity of the beer is foremost, so we don't use any extracts or anything like that. We did have a beer that soured. Um, when we used to brew at Watch City, which was um, kind of like if the brewery wasn't working, you kicked something and it would start working again. It was that kind of place, you know. Um, Fonzie? What? Like Fonzie? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like Fonzie. Uh, so a beer, a beer went, let's just say a beer went sour, and that wasn't the intended uh, flavor result. And we added uh, raspberry extract, and it was actually quite wonderful and turned yeah. out to be one of our most popular beers. So on the flip side, <laughs> uh, you can use them to your benefit, but um, I think if, if that's not what you're going for with a beer, it's not being promoted or advertised that way, and it's just an IPA, and you want people to think that it has all these fruity flavors and you're using something that isn't hops to get those fruity flavors or, or aromas, that to me is the opposite of integrity. So that, you know, that's just where... My thought process comes, um, but if you're saying it's a sour raspberry beer, then go help, go, right. go for it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> what about you, Chris? Um, yeah, we've never actually used extracts before. We use uh, fr fruit purees um, by and large for a lot of those fruit additions, um, and we've never really done it in an IPA. Um, so any of those type of IPAs we've ever had from Idle Hands, all all those fruity characteristics have been derived from hops. Um, well, you do see us use fruit extra, or not extracts, but fruit purees are in our Kill Your Idol series, um, which is geared towards creating, you know, um, basically a really fruity flavored beer that almost doesn't taste like beer, more of a cocktail in the end. So. Can I ask each of you how you sort of got your start into brewing? Were you guys home brewers before you decided to hop into the beer industry for a trade? And I guess we can go with, we'll start with you, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly was. I, I got my start in home brewing with my uncle back when I was before 21. <laughs> um, we won't say how far. 
Um, was your was your uncle a home brewer himself? He was. You know, my uncle was uh, or is kind of this you know down to earth guy and um, very Yankee ingenuity type of um, type of person. Um, I grew up in New Hampshire and he's from New Hampshire uh, as well. And you know, he just started making beer because he thought it was a cool thing to do. It was interesting to him, and I think you know, knowing how um, cheap my uncle is, it was probably like a good way to, you know, getting beer that wasn't very expensive in the end. So, um, <laughs> I, and so I, I kind of you know saw him do this, and I'm like, oh, this is kind of interesting because I have a very scientific mind, and I wanted to kind of understand the process. And so I went over to his house a couple of times and watched him and helped him a few times. And oddly enough, he was making lagers back then. And this was like 1988 or something like that. I don't even know. It was like <laughs> a long time ago. And I'm like, wow. What would have been the other beer style that most people were making if they weren't making lagers? Uh, uh, like an Irish red, perhaps, or yeah. some porter or maybe a stout. Something that like, you know, really is flavorful and packful and um, wasn't really in the market so much. Um, but anyways, he got, you know, fast forward, he got me a kit for Christmas, you know, when I was 20, 21 years old, still living in college, um, sat in the corner for a while, ended up uh, pulling it out in some boring winter night and brewed a batch of beer. And uh, luckily I had nine other college roommates that were happy to consume my mistakes. Um, but it slowly got better. Um, and so, you know, it kind of followed me through my entire professional, or professional career. I graduated college basically homebrewed for, you know, 16 years before I opened Idle Hands. And so it's, I'm very much deeply rooted in the homebrewing community in terms of my development and how I got interested into beer. Um, and it has followed me through my entire um, life, adult life. What about you, Matt? How did you get into homebrewing? If you were a homebrewer before? I, I did do a lot of homebrewing. I, uh, I was living in Amherst, um, flunking out of UMass. Um, with like serious level of energy, and uh, <laughs> well, I, if you're gonna do anything, I'm, do it with I passion. I went big. I went big, uh, and my friend Eric Shuddy from Holden was home brewing. His dad taught him how to home brew. Uh, we lost the security deposit on his apartment because the fermenters kept blowing up and ruining the ceiling and floor. Uh, and I moved to Flagstaff that next year. I feel like I just told you the story. Um, and I, at Flagstaff, Arizona, and I'm driving to my new house on Cooch Drive, and I turn around, and there's a homebrew shop at the corner called Homebrewers Outpost. So I immediately tried to get a job there, and I ended up not getting a job, and I ended up spending a bunch of money on equipment and homebrewing, and I brewed, I don't know, a couple hundred gallons that year. It was uh, 1997, and I was graduating college, and I had a lot of friends, like you, Chris. I had a pool table that went over well. And we had like parties with like six or eight beers on draft. I was making... So you had a bar, is what you're I saying? I kind of had a speakeasy, yeah. 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 And I was paying like... I, my, the house cost $1,000 a month. I rented three rooms for, nine, for, for a total of 900 It cost me 100 bucks to live. Everyone else paid the bills. It was awesome. And yeah, I feel like you're just rubbing in every millennial bit, living yeah. in so Boston right now in space. So, it's $100, completely free beer yeah, everywhere and a pool 100 table. Bucks, 100 bucks a month. And so I then uh, graduated and moved to Colorado looking for a brewing job. Yeah. And I ended up back here in Boston where I'm from, working at Harpoon. And this is now I'm celebrating. I don't know how long you guys have had your careers. Um, I just am about to celebrate my 22nd career. Are you a proud, po are you a proud pooner? Uh, I worked at Harpoon for like a minute. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is what they call themselves, right? I don't know. I, I didn't make up. I promise you I didn't make up that term. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's not. I was, there for <laughs> <laughs> I was there for one year and uh, left there to work at a uh, now defunct brew pub down in uh, Harvard Square called John Harvard's. And what about you, Alex? How did you first get into Ooh, the whole well, beer Well, um, I had... I've got 10 years, I think, under my belt. So I started home brewing 10 years ago, uh, met my business partner, Alex, who's our head brewer. And we met in grad school, started brewing together. He basically sent out an invite to everybody that we went to school with saying, who wants to learn how to home brew? He's a very educational type guy. And I said, that sounds cool, and went and started learning how to home brew with him. And within probably six months, we would brew once every two weeks, about, which is actually pretty aggressive now that I think about it. Uh, I was the only one left after about six months. I somehow just really took, for, took to it, and the two of us would drink Bud Lights and brew really good homebrew beer. 
Home brewing's a pretty intensive um, process, though, right? I mean, how does that? Uh, I mean, is yeah, there yeah. a way I mean, to casually homebrew? I feel like everyone yeah, who does yeah. that Sundays are good. Sundays are good because you yeah. can like throw on a game. You you know you could if you time it right. You know when you start, you can. There's there's an hour break here and there. You can go grab a go grab a case of Bud Lights. You know, I'm, I I feel bad saying that, but we honestly, I think went out of our way not to be crafty like nerds. We just right. We thought, oh, if we drink crappy light beer, then we'll be sort of shunning that uh, home brewer mentality, which at the time was a thing. Like people, when we started 10 years ago, I feel like home brewing was really taking off. There was yeah. a homebrew shop on Mass Ave. If anybody home brews, you know it because there's not that many around. And we knew everyone there. And every time you go in, you have conversations with the same 10 guys. And it's uh, it was happening. It was really happening. It felt like, you know, everybody in there was like, when are we going to take this thing to the next level? And so um, that's anyway, that's how we got started. So we, we looked around for, for contract brewing opportunities because Alex, my partner, had a certification, a brewmaster certification. So he felt like he, he had the, the beer brewing um, skill set under his belt. He brewed at a brewery in, in Rochester, New York after that as well. And so we were like, we don't have any money, so let's go look around and for breweries that have excess capacity, which is the way that Pretty Things was doing it. And some other guys at the time were looking at the gypsy brewing model, um, and that's essentially what we did, and we located a brewery that um, was completely unaware of that model, <laughs> so we had to, a little convincing to do to tell them, oh, you're not brewing every day that you could be brewing, and that was really like mind-blowing to them, so they were happy that they could make more money having us be there. And that's an interesting relationship that you have to craft as a contract brewer with a brewer. And I think all of you can sort of weigh in on this, but on one level, you're sort of supporting your fellow artist and creating something that you guys are passionate about. On another level, do you guys see, is there a sense of competition that happens between the breweries? Um, you know, when you're allowing a con contract brewer to come into your brewery, is there ever from some brewers this sense that, well, I'm allowing in someone who's trying to compete with me in the same business, or is the business culture not applicable the way that we think of it in these high-profile cases where you have people like Google literally suing people for putting a curve on their phone? What is that relationship like between contract brewers and the brewers that they work with and brewers in general with each other? I'm not trying to instigate a fight between you guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to throw down. I... Uh... I, I've had a lot of experience with this over my career. I've been that gypsy brewer uh, where I actually did all the brewing at the breweries. I brewed beer actually alongside Dan at Buzzards when I started Blatant, another company that I had before. And, uh, and actually, this is one of the first places to serve that beer. Um, and so we, I was doing that. And then I also worked at another brewery, <laughs> conveniently and ironically, also with Dan Paquette. We could talk about him all night. He's the uh, the principal, the term I'm going to now use. The, but yeah. he, he was he the started, man behind Pretty Things, right? He started Pretty Things, he and his wife, Martha. But um, before that, we worked at a brewery that was then called Concord Brewery, and we were a contract brewery. We made beer for uh, a variety of brands. So we were making beers uh, for these other breweries, and oftentimes we'd be like, oh, we got to make another batch of Archer's Ale. Like, Sherwood Forest, Archer's Ale, anybody remember that one? Um, Sounds exactly, magical. Exactly, that's my point. Um, <laughs> it, it was sort of, you know, and it wasn't a competitive thing. It was like, why isn't there, you know, Rapscallion Blessing in that tank or whatever? Like, why isn't there a beer that we're, that's our beer in that tank? Um, and then I then moved from brewing to sales. We got rid of all the contracts because we could fill all the tanks. Right. right? And I think there is a competitive thing inside of a brewery that way. Um, as a brewery owner now, um, with technically I got a little excess capacity, um, but I'm not brewing beer for others. Sure. It's just not in our business yeah. model. What about yeah. you, Chris? Would you have done that five years ago? I'm curious. Would I have brewed beer for others five yeah. years ago? Yeah. Absolutely not. No? All right. No. Um, I mean, maybe for you. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the How can you say no to that guy? The brewery community is very collegiate, um, and it has been for a very long time. Um, I think that's changing, though. Um, so to your point where um, other brewers brewing a contract beer for somebody, um, when they have excess capacity, I think is, that's why I asked, like, you know, five years ago, 
would you I mean, have I done that? I wouldn't do it because but... I don't respect that. I, I wouldn't do it because I feel that like need to fill the tanks with yeah. my beer. And did you yeah. use five years as a point in where Exhibit A would have been as a brewery, or was there something different five it's, years it's ago more within of an the in community? Industry thing. I, I think it's changed. You know, lot, yeah. things have changed a lot, um, even in the last two years in this industry, and um, it's be- become very, very competitive. Um, and you're having a lot of breweries that are entering the market. Uh, because they see the dollar signs, or they did see the dollar signs, um, and not necessarily because they're passionate about the product or about the business or about the company. Um, so I think you know five years ago was a good you know jumping off point where things I think started getting a little wacky in the industry. Um, five years ago, everybody was pretty much friends. Um, I think I, I don't remember who said it, but somebody out there said. I love the brewing industry because it is 95% asshole free. Um, was it Garrett Oliver? It was somebody like that. Well, I, I think it's probably like, you know, 75% asshole free now. But um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe being generous. Um, so I I'm kind of rambling on this. But is, that, is, that, is that a symptom of success, do you think? Or was it that craft beer really took hold and it attracted a different set of people who necessarily weren't in there for the passion. I grew up in the tech industry and the yeah. tech sector, and they describe in Silicon Valley when all of the venture capital money flooded in, and yeah. that was this demarcation point where you had passionate engineers and passionate guys trying to make things they really believed in to a lot of money people saying, put out whatever works, put out whatever makes money. What would you say happened five years ago? Was it just a natural rate of success, or did there a lot of outside influences come in? I mean, you can't um, you can't hide the fact that the industry was growing in you know double digits you know year after year for a good long while. So it's it's going to attract money at that point. People are going to realize that there's money to be made. Um, so I think you know five years ago is probably that point where you you entered that uber growth phase i think in the industry um where it started you started getting a lot of those breweries that were just opening you know large scale breweries because you know they had money to burn and somebody was looking to either um, build a really really large business and cash it out or um you know i guess just really build a large business and cash it out you yeah know, because that's really what that's really what they were trying to do in the end um, so I know back to the original point, you know, uh, contract brewing, you know, we, we brewed contract, uh, beer last year down at Dorchester, but Dorchester is designed to be a contract facility from the ground up. So there are those facilities out there now taking advantage of that model, um, where they know that there's, um, brewers that don't have a brick and mortar place, but still want to get in the game, um, such as uh, what, uh, Portico does, um, and catering to that specific model. Um, and those are the type of places that I, I prefer to work with versus trying to work with another brewery that may have a little bit of excess capacity because I never want to be in that situation where we're fighting for tap space, you know, with the beer that I brewed, you know, in their facility because to me that just doesn't bode well in the end. Yeah. And Alex, what is it like being a contract brewer in this landscape that Chris just sort of described? Do you feel that competitive nature that's coming from the breweries that you contract with? Do you feel that there is sort of this market saturation and it was very different five years ago? Uh, it's a little complicated. I, I think that the vibe that Chris was describing of that competitiveness has also sort of invaded the, the contract brewing space a little bit. Like, I feel like we're now one of the only breweries or representatives of a brewery that actually go to the brewery and brew our beer. Whereas I feel like five years ago, there was more of a community. People were proud to go to the brewery and actually be there and brew the beer themselves. And even if it was a um, symbolic dumping of the hops, whatever it was, they were there. And now I feel like... Is that a proud ritual in the beer well, brewery Well, it's community like that, all you can really do. It's sort do of like putting the, the game right over the yeah. coach of the Super Bowl. <laughs> it makes for a good picture. It's the easiest thing to do to make it look like you're doing something in the brewing process. Um, smelling them, whatever you want to Instagram. But yeah, I, I, think, um, I, I think now uh, I've seen just... I only really have a window into one contract facility... And we love working with them because 
they really care about working with us, and so we built that relationship, and it doesn't feel like we're going in there as outsiders or you know anything like that. But I guess your, your question was more about the competitive spirit or something like that. Yeah, so I guess, I is do you feel um, that there is sort of a sense that when you go and contract brew that you guys are collaborating in one sense, but at the same I, yeah. time, sort of what Matt was touching on yeah. too, is that there is that, a little bit of a sense that, hey, well, these guys aren't exactly us. They're trying to compete a little I don't, bit with us. I don't personally feel that at all, but um, you don't really cross paths, honestly. I wish there, even Dorchester Brewing, when they started, contacted us to try to get us to come brew with them, and, and we just basically said, and they're doing great now, so we said, you know, you're Apple's new thing, and I don't buy an Apple until it's the second generation. Like, I just want to make sure you know how to contract brew. Because contract brewing isn't brewing. It's really, it's like an operational nightmare. Yeah. It's all these different breweries with all these different needs and yeasts and all crazy amounts of hops and inventory and cans and all these things that you need to manage. And so um, when we, we stuck with Ipswich because of that, um, I did it because we knew they were, you know, really strong what they do and that they'd been doing it for a long time. Um, but no, I, th there's just, the, the reality is you don't interact with a, a lot of other breweries anymore. Like, I don't see Chris. I don't see Matt ever. Like, we don't hang out other than on this situations stage. like this. I mean, that's just me. Maybe you guys, like, get together all the time. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're I actually, wish. we were going bowling <laughs> after this. I thought you, I thought you knew about that. No, but but ser seriously, when I started in this, I, Alex and I were super excited to be in the industry. Like, any... 28 year old whatever idiots are when you get into beer you're like oh I'm making beer and I'm making money doing this this is really cool and there were all these events and get togethers amongst the Massachusetts brewers we used to have a text chain and like a Facebook thing and we go to Christopher's all the time that was the spot and talk beer and like say hey you got extra this hop or you need a bag of this grain whatever and that is totally gone by the wayside I think that's just a little microcosm of where the industry is as far as competitiveness. I, not that I feel like any ill will or competitive nature toward either these guys or sure, any other yeah. brewery. It's just the nature of a more ro um, mature industry. I sure. think we're hitting that kind of mature point in the beer industry like any industry does where, you know, some of them are closing and, you know, that may be your next question about that. Some breweries are closing. Some are, you know, lowering their not brewing as much as they were, and there's a shakeup. So, and that's just, that's normal stuff. So. Yeah. One thing that just, that you sparked, and I just want to touch on, is that, that camaraderie thing and that, that community thing that you're talking about. I, uh, I felt that a lot when I first started, joined the Master Brewers Association, going up to meetings all the time, meeting our heroes, really, like guys like Mitch Steele, who at the time was at Anheuser-Busch, now he's the, he's got his own brewery, and um, he was a head brewer at Stone Brewing for a decade. So there were those days where we had that, and now there was kind of this gap. And right now, at this moment, there's a massive improvement in that. But actually, I'm not finding myself hanging out with brewers so much, although I do get to hang with brewers on occasion. I'm hanging out with farmers, and I'm, I'm going to keep talking about farms because I'm, like, super jazzed about this whole Northeast grain shed that we're putting together. And so we have this focus on hanging out with the people who are actually growing and, and, and processing the ingredients that we're using, which is, it's, it's a whole other level of my ability to understand actually not just what we're doing every day with the ingredients to make the final product that you're going to enjoy, but more so to focus on how that supply chain affects us wholly. And what I mean is like, when you go to the store, are you buying flour that's made somewhere that you have no clue where it's made, or is it made by a, you know from a seed that was grown kind of regionally and ground at a flour mill near you? Are you going to bakeries that are using this flour? Are you going to distilleries that are using the grains? You know, and so there's all this conversation that's happening around that that's bringing us together. So um, a week ago, I was at a symposium, and there were 250 people at this thing. And I'm sitting there listening to brewers and bakers and distillers and maltsters and farmers talk about what we're doing. And it's, it was the most inspired I've been in a decade about 
not just, I wasn't inspired by the beer. In fact, I didn't even drink a beer the whole day. I was eating bread for like 12 hours, but I, uh, I did sip on some uh, short path, that, which was that, really good. That sense of community <laughs> is something that I, am, I in particular have noticed, and especially the way that breweries have really played a part in what I see as sort of a revitalization of these towns that were prominent in a more industrial era um, you know, they talk a lot about that there's a migration towards urban centers that, you know, some places in the heartland, but really that you can see right here in Massachusetts are seeing a little bit of an economic depression. But, you know, Chris, you're over in Malden, you're out in Framingham. What is that sense of community that you get opening a brewery in a town like this? Do you feel that it almost becomes a town center of activity? Does it sort of fill the dual role of being an economic engine at the same time of being with the tavern, like the one that we are sitting in right now? Go ahead. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> it's hard to quantify, though, yeah. I think. Um, you know, we, we have a tap room over in Malden, and we open it up to really any kind of community organization that wants to come in there and hold fundraisers and whatnot. So we do our best to kind of involve the community with everything that we um, that we can, um, and the city recognizes that. And you know, the the mayor's office is super excited that we're in town. Um, and I like to think that maybe I bring people into Malden, but it's again, it's hard to quantify. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, before we opened in Malden, we were over in Everett, and um, you know, to your point, opening in like just like kind of economically depressed and really industrial kind of places. Like, I don't know if anybody's ever been to the first Idle Hands Tap Room, um, but have. that place was, was frightening. <laughs> and it couldn't be any more industrial. Um, it was its, not the Encore? It was look and feel. Um, it, was, it was on the property the Encore was on. <laughs> but, um, so, I mean, you know, we, we went there, and I think breweries typically open in these places because, one, the rent's cheap. Um, and, uh, you know, opening a brewery is already a very uh, capital-intensive business. So you look for wherever you can find something to, you know, at least save a few dollars. Um, and opening in kind of these kind of run-down industrial type of areas was kind of like that was the model. You yeah. Know? Was there a hesitation when you first went over to Everett that, you know, this isn't necessarily a place where yeah. a lot of craft beer drinkers might go? It's a little bit out there. Was there a little bit of a fear when you went out there and said, all like right, I guess we're doing it? Fear as I was going to get stabbed getting out of my car? <laughs> yeah, there's a I'm little I'm going to use there fear, the royal fear, fear yeah. for anything. But yeah, I mean, what, you know, it, it is... I mean, back, back then, you know, this, we're talking nine years ago um, when we opened Idle Hands, um, you know, there was that build it and they will come mentality. Um, I'm not so sure that exists anymore. I think there's so many breweries that have opened up and there's, there's like a brewery on every corner that you're almost doing yourself a disservice by opening in an area like that because yeah. I don't think you're going to draw the crowds that you would have um, if you had done it, you know, nine, you know, even five years ago, perhaps, you know. So things have changed a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I put my brewery, Exhibit A, uh, in an existing brewery. So that was like, I wasn't afraid of getting stabbed or, um, in fact, we were afraid that people were going to show up and we weren't going to be prepared. Um, so I purchased Jack's Abbey's old facility. I don't know if people are aware of that. Um, and we painted over their logo inside the production hall, but we left it kind of there. Like, there's a halo there. And that was on purpose because there's this kind of, part of the story that matters, which is what that building was before we started. Um, Jack and his brothers and that company put a lot of good, you know, you know mojo in that, in that building and, and I, we ran with it fast. Um, we were also told that the neighborhood behind us, which is like the, the you know, the whatever, the development behind us is, uh, so, you know, stay away, don't, well, don't walk through there at night. I mean, it's Framingham, it's not Everett or whatever. But uh, those people that live there are coming into our tap room. They're drinking beers, they're walking home with four packs of hair razor at 19 bucks a pop. I don't know what they were talking about. Um, <laughs> but we definitely immediately felt this amazing connection to our community and how people were aware that our building was a brewery already. So like, oh, another brewery is opening, we gotta check that place out, it happened. And we immediately had people coming um, before we opened. 
uh, you know, now they're, I don't know where they are now. They're not coming every day now, but. When you guys opened your breweries, was there this sense that there was only a few beers that people were drinking? You know, like, I mean, I would say that I'm a big IPA fan myself, but I mean, now we're living in an era where you can walk into a bar, even a generic sports bar, I'm gonna name some names. Some of them happen to be by the movie theater down in Fenway, but. It's surprising when you walk into a place like Cask and Flagon, which I just named, um, and you see a sour beer on draft. It, to me, shows this sort of mat- maturation of the beer drinking community. But when you guys first started, I mean, you know, you guys really want to experiment some different styles. Was it difficult to introduce the variations of styles? And I'll start with you, Chris, because you have sort of put a big emphasis on the Belgian style. And then, um, could you first start just talking a little bit about what that exactly means? Yeah, so we opened um, with the uh, premise that we would be a 100% Belgian-focused brewery, um, and we were for a good three or four years. Um, And some of that was because I I thought that's where the market was going. You know, at the time, you looked at, you know, the the beer advocate, you know, top 50 beers or whatever, and they're all Belgian-focused. And I'm like, all right, so, you know, people people appreciate Belgian beers, and uh, I loved Belgian beers at the time, and the equipment that we started with lended itself to producing Belgian beers. What is that? What is that Belgian style? Um, you know, it's it's more of a yeast derived flavor characteristic than anything else, than kind of hops or malt. Um, so the yeast is really driving the flavor profiles of the beer. So you're going to get a lot of kind of fruity characteristics from the fermentation, also a little bit of kind of peppery spiciness, what we call phenolics, um, in the beer, um, and the yeast kind of is the showcase. Um, you know, not not to knock IPAs, but IPAs are kind of the opposite of Belgian beers, where, you know, the hops kind of take the focus of, of the beer. So, you know, we we went down that road, and we, you know, I was really loving with, like, Abbey style, so doubles and triples and quads and that type of thing, and we really kind of concentrated on that um, when we started off, and then, you know, out of nowhere, I could, maybe not out of nowhere, maybe I was just kind of blind to kind of the IPA craze, um, and I ignored it for a very, very long time. Was there a reason you were ignoring it? I didn't want to believe that that was the way the market was going, I yeah. think. And I wanted to kind of, you know, um, think that my original premise was still a valid way of, of running a brewery. Was um, it a rejection of IPA, the flavor, the style, or was it more that you had sort of started off on a certain path and you felt that you didn't want to deviate from it? I think it's the, you know, the latter. You know, I really wanted to, you know, put my foot in the sand and say, you know, this is, this is what, who we are and what we're going to do, um, you know, hell or, hell, hell or high water. Um, and then I, I, you know, realized that, well, it's either survive or not survive. So we need to kind of reevaluate, you know, how this, how how we see ourselves. And you actually, for the tasting menu tonight, you actually put on a New England style IPA and a double IPA. So yeah. it seems that you've you, you've come to sort of embrace full circle. <laughs> well, you sort, but it comes you sort of come to embrace embrace this style. But can you tell me a little bit about why you pick? I guess what first makes we have the four seam and the six seam. These seem to be in a little bit of a family for each other. Why are they different variations of a seam? Is that a baseball reference? Oh, it's a, it's hundred percent a baseball reference. So um, I like sports. You can tell. You know, back <laughs> back when we 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 kind of first upgraded our equipment at Idle Hands, and we had brought in um, Enlightenment, which was another um, kind of brand, small nano brewery brand. Um, who Ben Howe was the um, the founder of. Um, just as an aside, Ben Howe, incredible, amazing brewer, not so good on the business side. And so, you know, and he knew that. And, and, you know, through conversations we had with him, he's like, all right, you know, I don't want anything, like, to do with the business. I just want to brew the beer. I'm like, I need a head brewer because we're, you know, we're increasing our capacity and I can't do it all myself anymore. So it was a good marriage. But anyways, um, you know, I was working with him and I was working with another um, individual, Sean, um, who was our kind of our first, you know, hire um, brewing, um, and Sean and I were joking around a little bit if we ever brewed an IPA that we would name them after fastball pitches because to us, brewing an IPA was as simple as throwing a fastball, you know, and so it kind of stuck with us, and so you see beers like Four Seam, and we have a beer called Two Seam, and our rotating IPA is called Change Up, and these are all kind of like inside jokes, I think, to me, at least 
poking a little bit of fun at the industry. Um, and then we came out with six seam, which isn't even a baseball pitch. <laughs> but it fits with the whole I, I knew motive. that the whole time. You know? That's, I was sharp um, on that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just kind of my, my way of kind of having a little fun. Yeah. Um, and can I ask, you know, I'll go to you, Alex, right now. You have two beers on right now, the Chroma and the Two Point. Now, let's start with the Chroma. You call this a rye amber ale. And, uh, you know, I've gotten a chance to talk to you before. And I actually felt... This is an ideal burger beer for me. It's the kind of beer that I want to have when I'm having a nice, hearty burger. It's light and it's crisp. But can you tell us a little bit about, first, why you're calling this Chroma and what exactly people are drinking when they're having this? Okay. Uh, well, Chroma is one of my favorite beers. I call it beer. Uh, I feel like we've gotten into a place where beer looks like orange juice. Not that that's bad, but I miss brown beer. And so we wanted to make an, just a very simple amber ale um, that had a little bit of extra kick to it. So we added rye. We added um, a lot of nugget hops in the dry hopping phase, which isn't really that common to do. You get a little nice kind of earthiness and uh, floral thing going on. Chroma, though, as far as the name, um, we wanted to make it a very bright red beer. Um, my mother is Greek, and chroma in Greek means like bright red, essentially, a hue. All of our beer names tend to come from either architecture or design or something in that, that mode, so chroma sounded right. The beer ended up being a little browner over the years than red, but uh, I think it still fits. It's a very bright amber beer, um, and I think like I would love to see more ambers out there on the market. I just feel like um, we're kind of in this IPA-heavy world. It's great and everything, but... Um, <laughs> I think we're heading there, you know, like we're, we're on the way. We're kind of in the Pilsner lager world, and now we're getting to, like you go out west, right? Yeah. You guys ever go out west? Ever I'm from out there? west. Okay, like go there. There's a million ambers. Like western, but like western, western Massachusetts? It's ridiculous. I, oh, western, I, I western Massachusetts. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. You ever go? <laughs> but, it, go but, at the, but at the same time, you isn't the west coast Framingham? IPA kind of the signature thing from <laughs> California? So, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so if you're saying IPAs, yeah, West Coast right. IPAs are really bitter and really earthy and all that, and they're big, they're big. And that's, that's really more of a result of taste buds or because they're just a more mature market sure. and they've had more time to brew a lot of different beers and keep making them more intense and more hoppy and bitter and more earthy. Uh, but that doesn't really, I mean, represent what I'm saying. is like Fat Tire is right. sort of the Sam Adams of... Of you know they're in Colorado obviously with New Belgium makes makes that beer and it's an amber but the, that style and kind of like Chris I'm kind of getting lost here but like Chris was saying about sticking to your guns a little bit like when we started and Chrome is a good example of this we really just thought that beers that made sense to us that we didn't see a lot of that were more palatable down the middle a little bit like a fastball you know um, were we were really going to stick to that mentality rather than going for the fatty type, the fad beers. And we believe that really hard. <laughs> so um, we just, we did make our first IPA <laughs> like a year ago after seven and a half years. And that was the Escher. Um, Escher is an American pale ale, so okay. no, it's not, really, it's not really an IPA, bro. But, um, <laughs> no, we uh, graduate. Journalist over gradual here. Gradual diagonal. We all stay in our own lanes. <laughs> no, we made, come on, man. Um, Ask me about the 1972 New Hampshire primary. <laughs> no, please don't. Okay. <laughs> please don't. I would love you to expound upon that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, anyway, so yeah, we just... <laughs> we, we like making beers that um, make sense to us. And I think that's important to being a owner and a brewer is that you have to kind of stick to, to why you started it. Yeah. Um, it's it really... It's hard, like, kind of turning everything over to the, the popular styles. You have to keep a little bit of that initial um, passion that you had for the styles you believe in. So yeah. that, that, that's Chrome in a nutshell. Two points of Pilsner. I won't even talk about that. <laughs> um, and, and turning to you, Matt, you have a kettle sour on here, the sour cherry. Sours are a new beer style that I'm sure people in the audience are very familiar with. But for those who have never had it before, I have found that they are always thrown off because the first thing I always hear is, oh, it's like a wine. Now, can you tell us a little bit about what a kettle sour is 
and how you felt about a statement of someone drinking it and saying, oh, it's like a wine? Sure. Um, first, I want to say that it is not a new style. It is the oldest style. Um, back in the old days, like, not like West, like Western Mass, the old <laughs> days, but like, like the 70s, like the 1470s or whatever, um, they were making Kicking beer. Kicking it old school over I here. can't really speak on what those beers taste like, but I can assure you they were definitely sour. Um, they were brown. They probably even had rye in them, especially if they were brewed around here because rye grew here, right? So um, we could talk about Light Motif. Light Motif is one of the few beers in our portfolio that I did not name. Um, Kelsey Roth, our GM, named it. It is a German word talking about the ongoing musical phrase and how it changes. There is a definition that I'm missing right now in my head, but um, leitmotif, its spirit is that it is a kettle sour, and I can talk about how we make it. A lot of brewers will be kind of kind of hush-hush about how they sour their beers. Um, uh, in this particular Take case... Take notes, kids. <laughs> in this particular case, what we do is we make a, uh, a basically a blonde beer that consists of 30 to 40 percent locally grown wheat, um, 30 to 40 percent locally grown pilsner, and a bunch of uh, oats and carafoam and other various um, malts to give it body and texture. And then we find fruit that we really like. And for us, I've been so lucky to have connections to farms, again, the farm community thing. Uh, so I buy cherries from Roy Farms, which is, happens to be a hop farm in Moxie, Washington, but they also grow cherries and blueberries and apples. So we bought cherries from them. And then we have a local producer or processor, um, Fat Boy Foods, which apparently a lot of people are having not such good luck with him, but he's been amazing for us. Um, so he processes whatever fruit I can buy and delivers it in a 40 pound bag. And um, this particular beer is the, is the cherry version of our leitmotif. There were 2,000 pounds of cherries in this beer. I thought I was gonna get a red, giant, crazy fruited thing, and it's just- There was how many pounds cherries of cherries? Cherries don't deliver as much flavor as you think, or color as you think. Sorry? How many pounds again? 2,000 pounds. 2,000 pounds of cherries. Yeah, so that's- So that's like 8 million cherries. It's a shitload of <laughs> cherries. Sorry, that was GBH, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> We're cool, it's all online. Uh, great. There's no rules on the internet, as far well, as I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Leitmotif, we, we do it seasonally, just like you would any sort of farm to food type of thing, where when the blueberries are ready, and we do actually buy blueberries in Western Mass um, at Warner Farm in Sunderland, and they, we get strawberries from him. I get uh, cranberries from some maniac in Cape Cod that I don't remember the name of his farm. But So when the fruit is ready, we, we use it. And we don't really brew these beers until those fruits are ready, uh, which people don't quite understand because they think of, you know, seasonal beer has ruined us, I think, in general. Like, you know, I mean, what, what's today? It's like February, so like, not to throw Boston beer under the yeah. thing, but it's in the tank. I guarantee those beers are in the tank right now. It's freaking 30, well, it's beautiful today at 46 degrees, but it's February. A great day people. for a Sam Summer, one might say. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> um, so I brew seasonally. I don't serve to you seasonally. We make leitmotif throughout the warmer time of the year because it just makes sense. Uh, we brew stout when it's cold. You know, it's like not, I don't brew stout in July because it's a winter beer, um, but that's what the industry has done. And uh, that part I really get frustrated about because I drink seasonally. I don't want to drink Sam Summer in February. I want to sit back with that rye ale, you know, and enjoy <laughs> it. And it's like, it's darker, more hearty. Um, we, we, make a, we make a rye beer too. And uh, nobody buys it, ever. <laughs> <laughs> How much rye? We call it Danko. And what a great name. It's I've a great always, beer. I've always noticed this, that, that beer shares a lot of the same terminology as people who are describing marijuana. Don't ask me so, why. Well, Don't ask me why I know well, that. Danko, but I can say that with a lot of confidence. Danko has a meaning. It is not. It's not the devil's. Oh, lettuce, I know. I know what it, I know what dank means. But <laughs> <laughs> why? Why? Why is it resiny, dank? The variety. Totally of rye. chill. Why the, are these terms always going back to to beer? Uh, I don't know. I learned how to drink beer on Dead Tour. 
Literally. A Grateful Dead tour? Yes. Okay. Bad Caster Porters, Bass Ales. I mean, there's a lot the of marijuana elusive, probably like, going around there, too. The elusive Anchor Steens. Well, it, it's also that hops and pot are the same family. Yeah. yeah. Sort of. You know, really? That, that's the main thing. Yeah. I mean, that's Genius. the main connection. That, yeah. Uh, cannabis and hops, you know, are the same family of uh, genus? I think it? it's a genus. I think it's a genus, I'm yeah. I'm pretty sure it's a genus. So they smell similar. They have that okay. skunkiness, yeah. uh, all that kind of thing. The aromas are similarly cool. But then brewers also love smoking pot. So that's a, its own thing. I don't <laughs> think those two things are really... Um, you guys are all American <laughs> brewers. We've talked a lot about the breweries in America. But you touched when we talked about Belgian beer a little bit earlier and of course the Germans have always sort of claimed that they have the finest form of beer. Yeah. They have entire laws where they'll throw you in jail if you don't make beer the way that they do. The British say, well, our beer's warm and therefore it's better. Cat's out on the bag on that one. <laughs> um, but what would you guys say as American brewers, what do you think is the American mark on beer? What is the style that American brewers are predominantly known for? And what are the ones that you think that America should be known for. Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a step out a little bit on that, and I don't know that it's necessarily a style. Although, as a brewer of traditional European beers and uh, other non-American started things, uh, I think that American brewers are more known for creating the experience than it is just the liquid. So, for instance, we make a beer that we're super proud of called Goody Two Shoes. It's a Kolsch beer. Uh, it's a style I won't mess with. I'm not throwing fruit in it. I'm not throwing it in an oak barrel. I'm just, it's Kolsch, it is what it is. We serve it right, we, we don't mess with it. Uh, we're, very, we're really protective, not quite as protective as the city of Cologne, which they're not gonna throw you in jail, but you're not allowed to brew this style in any other city in the world and then call it this, so we have to say style or whatever. Um, but we're creating an experience that is not all that different Unfortunately, well, I should say, it's very different from what you'd get in the city of Cologne when you're drinking Kolsch. I don't know if anyone's ever been to uh, the highland, the higher elevations in Germany, but when you're not in lager country in Germany, you're either in Dusseldorf or you're in Cologne, Cologne. And <laughs> if you're in Cologne and you're drinking that beer, there's nothing like that experience. So if we, for a minute, in this bar can, cre can recreate that, and we're recreating that actually more from the service end, where Liam, I think, is at the bar and the other people at the bar are like handing you something that is this kind of, it's this real thing that, the, forget the liquid for a second, it's yeah. the life that we've kind of decided it's to all live. It's what Liam gives. It's, he brings a lot to the table. <laughs> but it's, it's one of, it's, it is, it's, it's, uh, it's more, it is the liquid, it's the friendships, it's the, it's the experience that we're having together as this, of, and you, you think know, that, and, and that's very unique to the United States, is that well, sort of I think this that tavern we're, we're aspect of it? it. We're, we're, we've totally ruined it on a lot of <laughs> levels, but we're recreating that now because we have these bar rooms that are focused on quality, yeah. both in food and beer. Certainly Atwoods is on that, in that world. So it's like, how do we, um, well, I can stop and say the style of beer is doesn't exist. Yeah. We, I don't, at least in my world, and you guys might have a different answer and I perfectly agree with it, but I think that America is the, we're a melting pot on purpose, so we just steal from everybody. Uh, the only style that maybe is ours is amber, and as much as I wanna drink your amber, we all know it's not paying the bills, right? So we make IPA because I have kids in college, well, a kid in college, art school, I got to make a lot of double IPA <laughs> to afford art that school. That kid's coming home. So you guys know? hear that. If you drink beer, you're paying for education. Yeah. To drink art more school. beer. But thankfully, she went to school in Portland, which has a very rich beer culture. Maine or Oregon? No, Maine. Yeah. We're, very nice. Yeah, we're right. psyched. I think, I think, Matt, you touch on a, a, a pretty poignant point in that, is that Americans are very good at co-opting things and taking ownership of something that they didn't necessarily kind of invent. That was a very nice, um, gentle way of putting that. <laughs> but um, at least in the beer world, they then take that and then amplify it. So you'll see things like, uh, you know, your, your precious Kolsch. You'll see breweries that will take that <laughs> beer and then dial it up to the point where it's no Assholes. longer a Kolsch. 
world, they'll add something to it. You know, they to somehow have the number one rated Kolsch in the country. Stop. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're here for. Fight. The Fight. Mice, the mice are going to start coming out. Um, but, uh, and this is, you know, kind of the, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we, we weren't, I, I think we weren't very successful in, in producing Belgian beers is that the American palate isn't used to subtlety and nuance. Um, everything that the American palate has ever experienced or um, is usually something that's been dialed up to 11. Is that why you, is that why double IPAs are so prevalent here in the U.S.? And if I go to I, London, I will struggle to find anything past a 5 or 6%. I mean, maybe. I think it's some of it. You know, it's like those flavors are just so intense. And, I mean, you got to look at the beer culture in America for a long, long time. Um, you know, everybody was drinking the macro lagers. And those things, they taste like water. Um, when you put it next to something like, uh, you know, a double IPA or a pastry stout or, or whatever it is. And I think Americans who got into craft beer were, were doing it in a way because they were um, being rebellious to kind of the existing beer culture and beer that they had been exposed to. So to them, a IPA was something so profoundly different than what they, their father drank or what maybe they drank in college that they, um, they were just kind of blown away by it. And I think um, styles that have that kind of intensity are what you see as being kind of very popular styles in the, um, in the American beer culture. How about you, Alec? Yeah, I have a few thoughts on this uh, because we brewed a beer that we called a Kolsch for a long time that's actually a Belgian beer. So we brewed a Kolsch. I know, right. <laughs> It had, you know, traditional Kolsch, a vice Kolsch, if you will. There's a little wheat in there, so that's still within the, the realm of tradition. Uh, that was actually our, our flagship beer, Fuzzy Logic. We brewed uh, with a little acidulated malt and all the things that, you know, you do to make it a Kolsch. Uh, but we used the Belgian yeast. So to me, that sort of exemplifies the American brewing freedom Freedom, yes, that's the word. The, the style that we, the, the ability to just riff and do whatever the heck we want to do and call it whatever we want to call it, um, while still respecting, I think, the tradition of German beers and, and uh, especially trying to em sort of emulate the culture uh, and experience of a, of a German brewery, it's all wrapped in. It's all wrapped in. We want to create that, but also do it our own way and, and not have to abide by the German purity laws, right? So that, that's American beer to me. Is you can do whatever the heck you want to do, but you still have respect. And like, if you guys have traveled to Europe recently, they have New England IPAs on tap. So like, what do we, like, they're clearly seeing that we have created something really cool and unique and different. And that to me was a big, like, big eye opener because having started doing a beer business 10 years ago, or, or no, eight years ago, I never thought that I would go to Europe and see American styles being promoted. I thought I'd go there and like immerse myself in European beer culture, and they're like, no, we want to do what you're doing. So that, that was just eye-opening, but that's uh, the way the industry's headed. Um, and you know, we, have a, we have a lot of questions from the audience that I, I want to get to, but I want to end on just one more question. I mean, we've talked a little bit about the history. We've talked a little bit about the current state of craft beer, your own personal histories. But where do we go from here in terms of we have this state of craft beer where now it is very almost commonplace. You can ask an average person going to a bar, what do you want to drink? They all likely want specifically craft beer. They might want one of the styles that we've talked about, a sour or a Kolsch. Where do you guys see craft beer going from here? You touched on that some breweries are closing down. There might be a little bit of a market saturation, but not necessarily in terms of business, but in terms of experimenting, taking advantage of that American nature to build and do kind of whatever Americans want to do. What do we see kind of on the horizon? What are the styles that are coming up now? Uh, well, I'm fresh off of Extreme Beer Fest, so... I may have a skewed opinion on this. <laughs> um, I was, uh, the Exhibit A booth was next to a brewery called Cinderlands out of Pittsburgh making fabulous beers. Behind us was this fairly unknown brew pub called Cambridge Brewing Company, I believe. <laughs> um, 
Never heard of them. They had a beer that literally they put a sheep skull into. They also had a beer that they used fiery hot Cheetos. Um, I like both of those. I'm not adverse to them. I tried both those beers, period. Um, (laughs) And I love Will at Myers, who's the owner and head brewer alongside Phil over there at CBC. And uh, I mean, he makes some seriously world-class beers, but those were goofy and fun. Um, Weldworks was behind us from Colorado. They had a beer literally called Taco Beer. Pretty sure Taco Beer is not taking over IPA anytime soon. Um, he told me how he made it. He aged it in an oak barrel that held hot sauce, and then he poured Orida taco seasoning right into it. Um, it smelled like a Taco Bell. It That's, was really that, I, I can't. I can't hate on that. I'll tell you what. Did it taste like a Taco Bell? I really did not want to try this beer, but I couldn't help myself. And all the people that were around me, including my brother, were like, don't, you, you don't want to do this. I'm to sorry, yourself. but a fast food beer sounds more so American than anything we I think were I've ever serving, heard of. We had a, an Elisha Craig barrel aged Imperial Stout. We had a porter with peppermint sticks and edible glitter. Um, <laughs> we, had, we called it a rare gem, and it was actually the most popular beer we served that night, well, alongside some other really cool, interesting beers. Um, including a three and a half year old barley wine. You know, how does that not be, how is that not the one that everybody's paying attention to? But uh, what was the question? I was sort of asking oh, where, where we going. go from here. Right, right. My understanding is glitter bombs and Taco Bell beers. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not totally opposed to it. I'm a little skeptical, but I, I'm, okay, pretty cool, I'm but okay with it. You're the expert. I, yeah, hardly. <laughs> I think that beer is going to go where we, as brewers, and as you, as consumers, help guide us, like we could dictate it and be like, okay, all the beers are hazy IPAs. Um, we make a giant handful of hazy IPAs at Exhibit A. We also like, we make Kolsch, we make Porter, um, we make Stout, we make Sours, we make experimental beers, um, we're, we make lagers. I don't know, what else do we do over there, Kev? A bunch of different beers. So we're not sitting here thinking like, okay, what's the next trend. We're thinking to ourselves, how can we help guide that trend? I want to be like, you know, Post Malone, where come in and do something different. I'm only using the Post Malone reference because the bartender did earlier, but um, (laughs) apparently he's coming here tonight to see us, yeah. Um, But I think it's our jobs as both, I mean, I'm a consumer too. I think it's really important for us as consumers to help drive the direction as well. And IPAs aren't going anywhere. Um, I, I rely on them, quite frankly, to fill our tanks and to pay the bills. Um, we rely on Kolsch for our internal love of what we do. We rely on Porter because it smells so freaking good when we're brewing. Uh, same with Stout. So there's all these reasons to brew all these, sa- these different beers. Um, some of them are sp- in the spirit of it. Some of them are financial. Some of them are just, we stick to our guns and we have to make it. Kolsch for that, for us, is that. I mean, we sell a bunch of Kolsch. Uh, I'm proud to say that we finished 19 as the largest producer of Kolsch in Massachusetts. But that doesn't say, that's not saying anything because no one's making Kolsch except for us and a few other handful of people. But the reality is, is we're trying to guide that. And I think that we can do that as both consumers and producers. Um, long live the rye, dude. Yeah. Chris, Chris and Alex, do, your thoughts? I honestly don't know. Yeah. You know, I am at a point in this um, in this industry, and I, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, like you alluded to, there's a bunch of breweries that are closing down. There's a, it was, it was a today, I think, that Mass Brew Brothers said there's 49, 49, 49 new breweries. breweries that are planning on opening in Massachusetts this year, and I'm just like, this is insane. I mean, 12 closed last year. Was so it 12? 12 closed wow. in 19 in Massachusetts. Well, we'll see more. Uh, we'll see at least 20 this year, I bet. Probably. If not more. Not um, ours. None but from, ours. from a style, <laughs> stylistic standpoint, you know, IPAs, you know, aren't, they aren't going anywhere. But I think what's happening now is everybody's, everybody's figured it out. Everybody knows the combination to brewing a New England IPA. And they're not unique anymore. And any brewery that is opening um, is producing one. And they're generally excellent. Um, and I don't think there's much that distinguishes one from the other when you boil it all down. Um, so I think that is going to become the, you know, um, the ubiquitous beer that just everybody has. Um, 
so I think it's going to lose a little bit of its luster. Um, you know, I get jazzed, you know, when I come down from my office and I, and I walk through the tap room on my way out the door and I see everybody with a liter or a half liter stein on my bar. And I'm like, that's the only thing, we only serve lagers in that beer or in that, in that glassware, so. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I thank you. Um, because that's what really gets me excited is people kind of um, going back and reappreciating or maybe finally appreciating um, the simplistic nature of, of beer and what it's meant to be and not something that is used as a canvas to dump fruit or taco seasoning or <laughs> peppermint sticks or whatever it might be into it. Don't forget the edible glitter. The edible glitter. Um, I mean... Uh, we've never been about that, and, um, um, and we never, well, we never will be about that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's. Uh, I think those are. Um, I mean, obviously, the Extreme Beer Fest is is designed to be that kind of um, environment. But those, to me, are, are fads, and I think um, eventually, um, fads die out. You know, and people move on. Um, and I think we're already starting to see that a little bit as people kind of transition into things like seltzers and and other um, non-beer um, alcoholic drinks. Um, and I think what's going to be left over is, uh, you know, the, the people are, are going to leave behind kind of those crazy, um, you know, those crazy beers. Um, and hopefully people are going to redevelop an appreciation for beer that tastes like beer. At least that's what I'm hoping. How about you, Alex? Yeah, that was really well put. Um, yeah, I think it depends on who you are as a brewery. I mean, we're a contract brewery, but we want to be a not contract brewery. So once we, we are, which is soon, we'll have a lot more opportunity to kind of express ourselves in the way that we want to and to try to follow, I guess, like Chris and Matt have alluded to, that you kind of have to follow the trends to a certain extent to keep people coming in and getting the beers that they expect to get at a brewery. IPAs and that, that sort of thing, but at the end of the day, you want to keep brewing the things that make you happy, and both of you guys have said that. Like, Obviously, your Kolsch means a lot to you, and you're going to keep doing that no matter what the hell the trends are, so um, I think that's a spirit that, that we really, really believe in. Um, I think as far as I think the interesting thing about like seltzers, like Chris mentioned, is that breweries can brew them, so seltzers are, unlike unlike um, cider, they're actually something that breweries can make legally, whereas uh, ciders, you, you need a separate license. I'm correct on that, right? Yep. So like even up in Ipswich, we brew up there and there's all these seltzer companies now. I was like, what the hell's going on? This is a brewery. And you just see the look on the faces of the brewers brewing seltzer <laughs> after seltzer. <laughs> I mean, dude, it's sugar. This one's sugar got cherry in it. it. This yeah. one's got raspberry. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So you guys are going to be here before Post Malone <laughs> shows up, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's a trend, and it's definitely in it. Um, it's tempting as a, as a small brewery to have a seltzer, and that's not a bad thing. I think having it, that option is totally within reason and, and all that. But most of the beers that people want have been made. Like, I don't really see a lot of insane innovation in the next five years. I really think people are going to keep making small tap rooms and finding their local communities and making just really good beers and doing what they do really, really well and finding their audience. And that's, to me, the cultivation of the industry rather than like new fad, fad beers that will come and go. Because um, they just, we've seen too many of them and they're not, most of them don't have staying power. It's the personality and the um, sort of uh, energy of each local physical brewery <laughs> that will sustain this industry and create really exciting new stuff and new innovative beers. But at the end of the day, like, we're not, we're not going to invent anything insane. I mean, I, I don't know. What do you guys think? Like, are we going to come up with the next, like, thing that nobody's ever seen? In my pocket you got here. a few things? Okay, fine. <laughs> I don't know. Imagine I'm a little frightened of what's coming up in your pocket. <laughs> <water>. <laughs> 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 yeah. There you go. It's, um, it's not that crazy. Can I ask you guys some questions <laughs> from the audience? We've got some, some yeah. fan favorites right here. Um, Patty would like to know, what is the best brewery you've been to in Massachusetts or perhaps somewhere else, and what set them apart as your favorite brewery besides your own? Besides my own. Um, 
I, oh. That's tough. You got to decide who you like and stuff too. Like as far as like I got to choose someone I like and. You can choose someone you like. You don't have to say who you dislike. So. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes it easier. I think okay so. At the moment, when I was in the brewery the first time, I was looking around and I'm like, wow, what a incredible, amazing system and how they did this. I don't know how they cobbled this whole thing together. And I'm walking through and I'm, I'm interviewing for a job at this brewery and I'm thinking to myself, what an amazing place. Um, and it was my favorite place at that moment and it was 1999, and it was, or 1998, and it was uh, Harpoon. Yeah. And I immediately like fell in love with the idea of wanting to be a professional brewer. Um, they hired me on the spot, which was cool. <laughs> um, I was there for a minute, like a year, and, uh, and I, yeah, that, that facility, it was the old facility. It was before they put in their 100 barrel system. It was a 25 barrel system. The head brewer at Dorchester, Todd Charbonneau, uh, was the forklift operator. And uh, he trained me on uh, pulling bottles out of cases, which was a pretty high-tech job, actually. I was making, I think, nine and a quarter an hour. And uh, I was just blown away by that facility. Um, it really struck me as like, how do I wrap my head around this? There's like 50 other breweries I can name, but... Sure. I like that. What about, what about you? Uh, in Massachusetts, um, you can be open anywhere. Easily, but. Notch. Notch yeah. is my favorite. Up over like, in Salem. Just, oh, yeah, I mean, that tap room is designed to be a European drinking experience, um, which I think is something that um, strikes close to my heart. Um, and the beers that Chris makes up in that facility are just top notch. There. What I've always loved about what Chris told me once about his mentality is he makes low ABV beers because he wanted to make a beer that he could drink with his father. And it seems like that, that sentimentality seems to be a big part about why you guys are into what you're doing right now. I, I think you find a lot of, at least the brewers that have been around for a while, they're, they're, they're done with the 8.2%, you know, double IPAs. Um, other than 16, because that beer is great. <laughs> <laughs> and they want something that's, you know, a little bit more sessionable, and it's, you know, 4 to 5%, and, you know, it has a, a little bit of flavor, but it's not, you know, going to, you know, destroy your palate. At least that is for me. Yeah. Alex? Uh, recently, I really liked my experience at Bone Up. Um, they're right down in Everett, across the street from Night Shift, and they kind of started as, like, we'll be the people. Go. people. Hello? Uh, will be the place people go when like the line at night shift is too long, but they have created a really small environment and a little intimate brewery that I like. That's the way that I want to do it. Um, it's really tiny and it's really kind of beautifully put together. And I think their beers are awesome. And they don't, they're not, they're not like hitting you over the head with their message. They're just like brewing awesome beer and being relaxed about it, which I just really like when I go to breweries. Yeah. So, well, yeah. going from relaxation to back to business, Pike would like to know, from double-digit growth to perhaps maximum craft consolidation on the horizon, do you guys see access to capital affecting new entrants or existing brewers and affecting the industry capacity that we have now? Like access to capital being easier to, to find? Will it, will it be more difficult to when you are an upstart brewery if i'm interpreting pike your question correctly is it going to become much more difficult to you're going to have to acquire a lot more capital to upstart and how is that going to kind of affect these smaller breweries entering the market i mean i just think it's that's a really hard question i think most a lot of breweries that open are not hurting for capital like they're people that have money so there's a lot of people there's, out there. There's a lot of dumb money and still around. Yeah. <laughs> That's to me, like when I see a lot of breweries opening quickly and setting their sights on these large operations, a lot of the time, it's not always, but a lot of the time it's they have money to, to blow. And I, I don't think the investment opportunities are driving the advancement of startups. I think it's more of a, oh, my God, this is like I see myself – with my foot up on the keg, with a beer in my hand, owning my own brewery, and I have the money to do it, why the hell wouldn't I do it? So I, I don't know. Maybe that's my like cynical, yeah. cynical view. Um, but 
Um, inv uh, most, if you t if you try to get raise money for a brewery nowadays with no money, uh, it's not as easy as it was five years ago. Yeah, they're like, oh, the industry's look around, look at the shelves, it's bloated. Like, try try talking to banks now. I mean, it's a totally different game. I just I don't think the idea that it's uh, easy to walk in and say, oh, look at this this mature market. I can uh, you know get the capital I need. You need to have money. Yeah. Um, How about you, sole proprietor? <laughs> Burn. Is that the way it's going to be, huh? Um, no, I mean it's. I mean we we uh, you know finance growth through our cash flow at this point. Um, at some point, we probably will need to take on a small loan just to put a canning line in because I don't have that much cash sitting around. Um, but. We're an established business right now. I mean, I have a model that I could take to a bank and say, listen, I can actually save a $1,000 if you give me a loan mm -hmm. um, that I can easily pay off because I'm already paying my mobile canner, you know, this amount of money every month. So those are the type of deals that I would do. Um, but we're not looking to kind of raise any capital. Um, I think that there is still a lot of, I alluded to, some dumb money out there. Um, but I think in another year or two with, uh, the way the market's going, that that's going to dry up as well, and people are going to wise up and say, and realize that this is not a, a uh, an easy industry um, to operate in. It, it, you know, it, maybe it was 10 years ago, but um, people have caught up. Things have changed, and uh, uh, they're hopefully going to go by the wayside. And then the passionate people that are still around are going to be the ones that are um, going to hopefully survive and. Uh, start breweries and, and grow them. Um, did you have a thing you want to tack on so there, Matt? We, we opened our brewery without any uh, outside money. Um, my partner and I uh, are the only investors. No special will. interest, no super PACs. No, surprisingly. <laughs> um, all my phone lines are open. Um, <laughs> we, we don't... We, I literally get emails, phone calls, and, ma and actual mail that comes in the mail um, every single week for banks, capital firms, venture capitalists, whoever, that are looking to give us money. Um, I have a good friend who just opened a brewery, and unfortunately, they were very strapped for cash when they were opening. They spent too much. They, you know, the electrician kind of overcharged them. And when they opened, they kind of had no money left in the bank. There's like a couple grand in the bank, and you're like, oh, we can't really operate unless we have, you know, you need operating capital to run a business like this. And, and uh, one of the big conversations that they're having in their offices right now are how do we find more money, and they can't. There's no one willing to give them money. They're open four months. They're strapped. They have equipment, but the equipment's already spoken for because they have a mass development loan. Um, or an SBA loan of some kind. So I think even established, or not even well-established, but s soon, s you know, recently established businesses, I think are the most vulnerable and are gonna have the hardest time finding money. Uh, you write a business plan, you've got some money, you find this location, someone's gonna take the risk. I don't know that a bank's gonna be doing it right now as much. I mean, there's a few banks out there that have their eyes are wide open. Um, Country Bank, which is a Western Mass bank, invested in a very small brewery called Treehouse. Not a bad investment. Um, worked out pretty good. They ended up building a $25 million brewery in Charlton because of that first loan they got from Country Bank. I happen to have a sav savings account there. Uh, it doesn't seem to be growing. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I do th think that, yeah, I, I think that the money, I, I agree with both of them, that the money is going to not only dry up, but the but they're going to want it sooner, you know? Yeah. Uh, investors are, if I had investors right now, they'd be knocking on my door asking me to pay them. We're in a position that now that we're, we're lucky. We're kind of like, we're actually making a couple bucks. So um, I'm glad we're in the position we are that we didn't have to do that. But uh, most breweries don't. Most breweries have to be paying those loans down every day. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a risky proposition for any investor at this point. Well, while I've got your attention and while you're speaking already, Matt would like to know, I just like this question, why is Exhibit A called Exhibit A? Uh, Matt is an attorney. 
and is uncontrollably drawn to your brand, assuming Matt works a lot of criminal cases, would you considering sponsoring Matt's law firm's softball team? So it was sort of a half business. Raise your hand. Half Matt. a little bit about Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this. It this, wasn't me, the only lawyer named Matt in the room. There's a lot oh. of exhibits this man has to present in his law cases, so well, I don't know who he's defending. Let's just. We'll start at the beginning. Um, every brewery has a great story on why they named their beer, they, their brewery, what they named it. Ours sort of is, it's changed over time. I started with the scale. I like the idea of using a scale. The first scale was like this vine-covered, ethereal, natural scale. And I hired this guy, Kelsey Roth, and he was like, nah, we're not using that scale. I can't reproduce it. It's going to look ridiculous on a glass. It's gonna, how do you want, I wanted it to be this big and this big. And he's like, I can't do that. I, let's, let's regroup. I love the idea of the scale. And my partner at the time said something to the effect of, you're always on, you, you love to be watched, you love to be heard. That's not a bad place to be on the stage, I guess, if that's the case. Um, you are an exhibit in yourself. And we're gonna put the brewery behind glass. You're gonna be like a fish in a fishbowl. And that's, I've brewed that way. I brewed that way at John Harvard's back in the day, um, at Offshore on Martha's Vineyard in the middle, middle part of my career. And I do like that. There is vanity in what we do. Um, people seem to have this affinity for beer and, and the people behind the beer. Um, we named Exhibit A because my partner thinks I'm always on exhibit. And <laughs> we, thought, we thought it would be funny for a minute and we thought it would be logical that if we named our brewery Exhibit A, that lawyers would like us, and that lawyers have money. Would you like to sponsor Matt's law and firm softball be, team? Well, I'm a, I'm, Exhibit A will be the sponsor of the <laughs> fall, uh, the next year's fall 11 and 12 basketball for Palmer Youth, so Palmer Youth Basketball for my son's team. We'll see if it's in the budget to, to do your softball yeah, team. Yeah, so Matt, learn how to play basketball, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you have to be 11. Um, <laughs> But he, we can we can fake that that we can work that. But out. we do have this kind of fun look at it. And exhibit A is about presentation. It is about being on exhibit. It is about um, beer being more than just the liquid and more about that experience that we have with it. And uh, we thought it would be cool to use a letter and put quotes around it. We realized it sucks for social media. It sucks for like email addresses. Like I got <laughs> dashes and everything. But it, you know, we, we, we're happy with it. I'm super proud of it. We also took the beer names from it, Goody Two Shoes, Innocence, Wandering Thoughts. We just couldn't come up with a name, so we called it Wandering <laughs> Thoughts. Um, yeah. Um, this one is directed to all of us. Um, so if you were going to buy a 12-pack to watch the game, what do you get? So last Sunday I watched the Puppy Bowl, so I decided that I would I would probably get a, a Notch Pilsner. I agree with you, Chris. I think it's an easy, crushable, but very flavorful drink. It's a perfect drink to get on a Sunday, whether you're watching the Puppy Bowl or the other dumb game that was on that day. Um, it's a great drink to have on a Sunday because you know that you can have a few with your friends. You're not going to have to feel a hangover the next day and yet you're still getting the delight of having that powerful packed flavor in there. So how about you guys? Alex? Uh, the beer for the big game? Any so, game. Whatever you think is the big game. Choice. Oh, um, yeah. Other than my own Pilsner, which I love drinking on a, on a nice hot day, the game. Uh, I would say um, I really go with uh, all day. I don't know. Like they just That's by Founders Brewing, right? Found, Founders all day, yeah. I mean, that's just a good crowd pleaser. To me, when you think about what you put in your fridge, it has less to do with you and more to do with who's coming over. Like what's going to make people not say, "Oh, I can't have that." So, to me, I try to be the most accessible and all day seems to please the most most people. That's a pretty boring answer. <laughs> 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 it's good beer. <laughs> um, so here's a little hidden secret, being a brewer and a brewer owner. Um, you rarely actually go out and ever buy beer. <laughs> yeah, 
Matt came by and uh, picked up a couple of pallet racks last week and dropped off a case of beer. I've been drinking that, you know, all week long. Um, actually, I only had a couple cans of it because my staff pilfered most of it. But, um, you know, people just, they're always constantly bringing you beer. So, um, and the rare occurrences where I don't actually have somebody else's beer that they've dropped off, <clears throat> I'll just grab something out of my own cooler and bring that home. Um, but I guess if I was to buy a 12-pack, I'd probably buy Sierra Nevada Pale Ale because that beer is, to me, the epitome of what craft beer is and was and should ever be. Okay, Chris stole my, my answer. <laughs> so I'm going to change my answer. <laughs> it's true. I, I don't buy a lot of beer. Um, you don't start with the exact same answer but, he had. <laughs> no, no. I, well, I, I love Sierra Pale Ale. And it's one of those beers. We used to get it for $69 a 50 liter when I lived in Flagstaff. And it was the fridge beer. It's just what we always had. So I had a kegerator. Next to my home brew, I had Sierra Pale Ale. Um, but it's not, I'm not going to use that beer tonight. Um, <laughs> we still get mail for Jack's Abbey on occasion. So when that happens, I make it a point to deliver that mail myself. There's a few reasons I do that. I do that because I want to go see my buddies that work over there and that own that brewery. I also do that because it gives me a chance to go over there and have a beer at their bar, which admittedly I rarely pay for. Um, House Lager is their now flagship, I guess. Uh, it's a great beer. Um, it's reasonably priced. It's moderate in alcohol. It's in this big, beautiful 16-ounce can. So what happens, what's happened the last three times that I've gone to Jack's Abbey with their mail is I've inevitably run into someone in their shop that works there that's trying to spend their free money that they get from their employer. I think they call it a scoop or a, I forget what they call it, but it's their money. They get a gift card or you know they get their hundred bucks a week or whatever they get uh, to spend in the, on the food and, and on their merchandise to purchase things for their friends and family and themselves. So I walk in and Joe Connolly is there, who's, who's the, uh, I guess, director at Springdale. And he's like, hey, man, I got like a few bucks I got to spend. Can you, can you help me? And I'm like, ah, sure, I'll take a 12-pack of, uh, or a 8-pack of the house lager, uh, or 6-pack. I don't even know how many there were. But so he gave me that. He also gave me this like, nice bottle of some barrel-aged stuff, which I gave to the staff at the brewery. Um, their beers, to me, are the definition of drinkability, uh, La it, it, there's no pretension. It's they're they're just they're simple, uh, fun and imaginative beers on the lager world. Uh, so it's not house lager, just so you know. It is a great beer. But the next week I was there, that pilsner they make, it's called uh, post shift. Oh, so glorious. That's the beer. And there is that that beer is in my fridge, uh, right now next to Kolsch. Um, <laughs> to me, it's about what, what, like you said, like what do I want my friends to drink when they come over? What do I want to share? And generally, it's my own beer because it's there. But um, it, yeah, that's the beer. Post shift pills. What yeah. did you guys interpret the big game to mean? I thought I clearly thought it was. I love Bowl. the halftime show. I'm just saying. Super Bowl, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't even watch it. I, no, I, I just. What did you oh. interpret the big game supposed to be? What is like the big occasion? The, the big game. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Life is the, the big Australian game. The Australian Open Finals. That's what I was, I was There you go. Okay. I assumed that's what you meant. You're going to need more than 12 <laughs> beers for that. <laughs> I thought it was the kitten bowl anyway, not the puppy bowl. No, it's the puppy bowl. Don't worry. There's a kitten bowl too. <laughs> what? There is a kitten bowl. <laughs> uh, you have opened up a brand new world for me that I need to explore. I might need to call out of work the next couple of days. Um, on our last question, Mateo would like to know, what obstacles and issues do you face and see that need to be tackled or dealt with in the distribution and tap line aspect of your business? Uh, that's a big, giant question. Um, we self-distributed for our first two and a half years, and we're now with uh, Atlantic Beverage Distributors out of Holliston that cover the whole state for us. Um, they helped us grow like 75% this year. Um, we're fighting every day. There's all these beautiful tap handles. You'll notice ours are like these tiny little stubby things. We do that on purpose. Um, I am never going to brew an Allagash 
or an Allagash. I'm never going to brew a Belgian style whipped beer expecting to get that Allagash line. Um, good luck to any brewery who wants to do that. We're constantly fighting this battle of the rotating tap lines, uh, storage. Uh, we require cold storage for our beers. That's a giant friggin' issue. Um, bone of contention, too. Retailers seem to hate me for it because I'm kind of militant about it. I've literally fired customers saying, you're not allowed to order my beer. You, can, you can fire a customer? I, I can choose to not deliver. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Um, I've actually created a couple of enemies because of it, wow. maybe even potentially. You're not the only one. I'm sure. <laughs> um, it matters, the condition of our beers, and if they're storing them warm in the window. Um, nobody heard that, right? Um, it's a problem, and I, ha and I really believe that uh, that distribution world is not really catering to that love affair that we have with freshness and quality and whatever. Some of them do. I mean, I have a great distributor that really cares about the fact that every single Monday I'm canning Cat's Meow and they are delivering that beer starting on Wednesday. So you should be getting Cat's Meow very fresh every week. Um, if it's old in the store, I could say all day, blame the store or blame the retailer. That's my fault because I don't have a big enough bandwidth to look at every store. I mean, we went from 200 retailers to 1,400 retailers this year. Um, I. I I showed up at a place the other day to have dinner, and I was like, oh, the, my beer's there. I had no idea. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, hard, it's a hard balance to uh, manage, actually. It's a, it's a full-time job for like 20 people. I have two people doing it. Wow. You guys, do you have opinions on that? Well, I mean, Chris and I have both delivered kegs ourselves. I know that because I've seen him doing it. Uh, maybe Matt has too. Still do? Okay, cool. I can't, I'm not allowed to anymore, but um, when we brewed at Watch City, like Chris and I would run into each other every once in a while. But yeah, to, I'm like you, Matt, militant in when I was delivering and the uh, freshness and making sure that it went into the cold room, which most uh, distributors just leave it, by the way, like out in the alleyway and it gets hot in the summertime. So if you really give a shit about your beer, you want to make sure that beer goes in the cooler. That has nothing to do with the question that you asked, which is how do you deal with the distribution arm and all that? Personally, for my business, it really is less about distribution and more about creating our own brewery that we can not deal with distribution. <laughs> so we don't have what Idle Hands and Exhibit A has, and that's what I, we're working towards. So for us, our, all of our energy is toward not worrying so much about our distributor and, and brewing and selling all of our beer on premise. And I think that's a direction that a lot of companies are going, like even ones that you think are kind of you know, untouchable, the Trilliums and those guys, they're all opening tap rooms with mock breweries in them to sell beer. Why are they doing that? Because on premise makes a lot of financial sense. Uh, and I think that's ultimately a the direction that the whole industry is going to go, but that's just me. I, I have a question. I don't Liam, go. I drink beer, but I know you did. I, I did, but <laughs> <laughs> what pisses me off, um, it's not necessarily, well, this is what I've noticed. You go to the tap room, I'm, I'm calling on night shift right now. <laughs> they're not here, they can't wow. defend themselves. <laughs> I, I am with Liam, actually, on that point. Why? I, I have a good reason why not to sell it for less. Because it'll take people away from you. Oh, As, not, that, that's okay with me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I liked Liam the second I met him. Um, and that was tonight, by the way. So I don't go way back with him. But I, w w years ago, I opened a brewery called Mayflower. I was not the owner. I was the brewer. I, got a, I had an opportunity to build a brewery with someone else's money, which was like this unbelievable experience. Without that experience, I wouldn't be where I am today. 
and uh, brewed amazing beers there that I'm super proud of still to put in my fridge on occasion. I should have said Mayflower Porter. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, yeah. Um, and so the, the point of Mayflower, if I'm correct, it was to brew beers that you could actually, they were having on the Mayflower, correct? Sure. Um, that's, I don't know. That's what, that's what a salesman told me one time. Yeah, sales guy was Sounds shit. like I was a sucker for that. No. Um, I don't know. I don't remember that as far as like the initial meetings we discussed about making the beers. But um, You guys but never took a trip on a ship and had beers with each other? We deliberately line priced our tap room with the area stores and bars because we didn't want to sell it for less for the fear that they would not want to support us because we're under undercutting them. Right. Um, that's the reason. And I think that that is a smart business uh, decision. Uh, we charge less than, say, Boston prices, but it's Framingham. So in our tap room, our cat's meow is six fifty. I don't know what it, how much you charge here for it. I'm guessing 7 bucks or 8 bucks in that range. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nine fifty at Lulu's. I know that. Um, I called them on that and asked them if they could maybe consider maybe a couple bucks less or 50 cents less. Um, I didn't love that call. Uh, but I do think it's, I think it's important to protect the bar room by not undercutting them. Right. And the retailer. I mean, the retailer, there's no margin there. You know, the, the margins in retail stores are terrible. Um, the bar only has 82 seats. You know, he's not going to, you know, bar owner's not going to be able to uh, sell as much beer as us. So I think it's important to uh, protect them. Um, last, I, I know I said the last one was the last question. This is genuinely the last question. But, folks, we are taking donations for ALS for ALS. Can one of you guys tell us a little bit about exactly what this charity is? I'd be happy to. Um, ALS for ALS is a, uh, I don't know who it was started by brewers or, or not, but... Basically, um, every year, a select bunch of brewers get together and create a hop blend um, with Yakima Valley, or Yakima Chief, um, that they then give away to brewers to brew a beer with. And that beer, with the, uh, the assumption that whatever profit is derived from that beer is then donated to the Ales for ALS organization. Um, and they are a fantastic organization because um, I think a majority, if not all, of that donation goes to research of ALS, um, which to me is a, a, um, a very important organization. Um, my wife's brother-in-law has ALS, so when he was diagnosed like two, three years ago, I, you know, we weren't participating in the ALS for ALS um, uh, brewing, um, and I immediately jumped on that, and I, and I think it's uh, just important that we, after seeing how Kevin has suffered, um, that we do whatever we can to kind of, you know, help cure this this terrible disease. So F fantastic. Well, if you've already made a donation, thank you so much. If you'd like to later on, the bucket is right over here. I just wanted to thank you guys for coming over here. Matt, Chris, Alex, thank you so much for taking the time to be part of the Atwoods interview series. Mm -hmm.